You ready? Okay, very good. So, hi everyone. Okay. Thanks for coming uh, here in person and also online. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me to the lecture fall series here at OFI. I'm always excited to talk about metaphors. It's always fun for me. Let's see. I hope it's also going to be fun for you. <laughs> this is not just my work, but it's actually joint work with my very uh, dear colleague, uh, Leonard Wachowiak. So we've done most of what I present today in several papers together. And we are still collaborating on this topic of conceptual metaphors and also image schemas, which is kind of related. Um, so you're also welcome to contact him if you have any questions that are that you don't want to address to me. Um, the whole idea is based on the principle and theoretical foundation of embodied cognition. So the idea that our cognitive processes are somehow rooted in our physical interaction with the world, in our body's interaction with the sensory world. So the idea is really that cognition is not just something abstract in our mind, but that is something that is shaped by how we experience the world and those recurring patterns that we have in interacting with the world then shape these schemas or form these schemas that influence uh, higher level cognition as well, such as language. This idea goes uh, back to George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, who are, especially Lakoff is the person who has done most on conceptual metaphors, I guess, in the beginning. So one example is, as a child, we make very early experiences with things that can be inside other things. Uh, so for instance, we learn that liquids can be inside a glass, and if you spill it over, it's not inside the glass anymore. <laughs> Um, that's the first experience of a container. We can also go inside and outside of things, such as a box or a house, if it's a playhouse or a real one. So we have repeated and recurring experiences of containment. This is even uh, before we start speaking. So some of these already start forming before we can even speak. Um, so then these fundamental experiences are believed to influence language in the way that we use those uh, constructs in, in uh, expressing things such as emotions or higher level uh, abstract concepts. So for instance, to say he's out of his mind uh, resonates of other things that are out of other things in the physical world. Or it's very common in English, German and some other languages to express emotions by talking about the body as a container and then when you get angry, the, the container overflows, or when you're very happy, the container overflows with joy in that case. So there are many examples for that kind of um, metaphor. So conceptual metaphors are this cognitive mechanism that allow you to transfer knowledge structures. So not the entire concept as such, but really knowledge structures from one domain to another the ones that we are most interested in are the ones that transfer from the physical world to the abstract world, because that's the most interesting one for us. These are the most common type of conceptual metaphors. So it's usually you have some kind of source domain that is um, rooted in the concrete world, and then you have an abstract domain to which you transfer those knowledge structures. This is also called metaphorical projection or domain transfer. So one example that's always used, that's like the most common conceptual metaphor you find everywhere, is this idea of love is a journey. So you have all these path and journey um, ideas or, or the, uh, concepts from this domain that are used in order to express um, ideas about love. So if you say, I don't know where our relationship is heading, it's a very clear walking along a path, uh, following a journey kind of metaphor or we will go our separate ways is exactly the same idea of, you know, you have a path that you follow and then you, you split paths, so to say, so you're not on the same path anymore uh, if a relationship doesn't work. So here, the source domain is really the physical domain of walking along a path, following a journey, and then love as the abstract um, domain to which concepts are transferred. So why does it make sense uh, to analyze metaphors at all? Uh, the idea is that metaphors are everywhere, so whenever we communicate, whenever we talk, um, there is a metaphor there. Not always, there are some expressions that are not metaphoric, 
But here we really don't uh, mean a metaphor in the rhetorical figure sense. So it has nothing to do with similes or elitos or those kind of things. It's really this idea of the main transfer. And this is much more common than a figure of speeches or a metaphoric language in a literary sense. So metaphoric language has also been found uh, to be more persuasive than non-metaphoric language, which is an extremely interesting study um, that I recommend by Bakpa Karan and Shutuva, who've done a lot, who's, who have done, and some other colleagues, who have done a lot of work on metaphors already. And they analyzed uh, the success of profiles on social media to see uh, when, if people are more successful and if those people that are more successful use metaphoric language or not, if there's a pattern there. And they actually found that people um, who tend to use metaphoric language have more followers, have more reactions on their posts and so on. So that's quite an interesting study there. Uh, conceptual metaphors are also used to, to convey emotions. So it's very much connected to our uh, most inner self. And the idea to use language models in connection with metaphors is that it might be able to help us to analyze such uh, language across uh, natural languages. So not just to have some few examples as it is done now in English, uh, or maybe four or five of them in Spanish or German, <laughs> but to have really a bigger corpus of language that is uh, annotated by metaphor. So we can also analyze then how they differ across languages and um, how things are conceptualized differently depending on which language people speak and the language is naturally connected to the culture as well. So this is also a very uh, transcultural topic. There are uh, three major tasks that are interesting or have been done uh, from the computational perspective for metaphors. The most common one that most people have done is metaphor detection. What we have uh, introduced or, or contributed to, I think two or three other people have looked at this as well, is metaphor identification. So I'll talk about this in a minute. And the third one is to do either of these in cross-linguistic analysis or cross-lingual analysis. So the metaphor detection is the most basic one. You take a sequence, you have some kind of sequence of natural language and you try to determine uh, whether individual words of that sequence or the entire sequence is metaphoric. So very frequently the corpora are sentence and then one if it's metaphoric, zero if it's not for the whole sentence. That of course makes it a little bit difficult to understand what's going on, where exactly in the sentence the metaphor is if it's a very long sentence. So for instance, uh, what you do here is you look at the different meanings a word can have in their context and then you try to evaluate whether the, meaning, whether the meaning of the word is a physical one or an abstract one. And if it is abstract, whether, the whether there is a physical meaning that is related to that abstract one. So the mouse can be out of the cage, so you can let the mouse out of the cage, which is very physically opening the cage and letting the animal come out. So here the idea of out of is really very strongly related to the physical world. But then if you use the same expression out of for an abstract concept, it still resonates of the same idea. So you're out of your mind, you kind of lost it, you know. So the, uh, these two meanings are connected. So you can still um, see the reflection of the physical meaning in that second example. Uh, for this, uh, we have a tool that's on hugging face if you're interested. It's also without computational uh, skills. You can use it. There's a demo so you can try some sentences if you want. It's supposed to be uh, multilingual. We, I have to admit we have only tested it on English, <laughs> but the model it's based on is multilingual, so it can handle other languages. How well it works hasn't been evaluated because that's what, that was part of a paper for metaphor detection. So label zero here means all of the words in that sequence are non-metaphoric. So the model determines all of these are literal or at least non-metaphoric. Um, for the second one, it says, um, hold on, uh, there are some elements here that are actually metaphoric. So this uh, application tries to differentiate between um, metaphoric words and non-metaphoric words, which is already a little bit more useful than just saying the sentence has some metaphors in it or not. So you at least already try to determine where it is. It still doesn't know what it is, <laughs> but at least you try to determine where it is. This one wasn't a um, generative model, so that's based on a classical large language model, so pre-trained transformer called XLMR, 
that was used as a basis for this. It's already multilingual. It has up to 100 languages. But as I said, try uh, for yourself. You have the link there uh, on the slides. Um, I'm happy to send it if you're interested, um, if it works in other languages and how well it works. <laughs> Um, we tried to use this kind of idea to then systematically analyze how words are used uh, related to a specific concept. That is one use case of how you can use metaphor detection in the end. So we were interested in um, how words related to the overall idea of support um, are used metaphorically or literal. Okay? So support has this physical, strong physical meaning, but then there are so many synonyms of support that are not physical at all. So they only have like an abstract sense. So this is what we tried uh, to test and see uh, what's the distribution of words in a corpus that is really focused on support. Uh, I'm not sure you can read it very well, <laughs> but yeah, there are some that are more metaphoric on the left side. So you have hold, maintain, sustain, all of these still have this um, resonance of this resonating of the physical support of a weight somehow. Um, and then you have back and stand and bear something. On the other side, you have words that are extremely uh, abstract. So maintenance has not a lot of, um, doesn't bring like physical support anymore, livelihood, subscribe and so on. And then you can go ahead and analyze the context of these and really see how physical support differs from um, non-physical support, where you don't have that physical connection anymore. So this was the idea there. Um, metaphor identification takes the whole thing a step further. So some papers that have been published before give models a sentence and a list of possible um, source domains and then try to um, stage the whole task as a classification task. So they say, which of these classes does um, this specific input sentence belong to? We thought it would be interesting to see how much knowledge there already is in those models. So without giving any, any classes at all, like completely open generation of source domains, completely open prediction. Um, so you give the model a sentence or two, and you give the model the target domain, and then you ask it to predict the source domain. So that was the kind of task that we tried. Why is it more interesting to predict the source domain than the target domain? Um, because the target domain is usually more explicitly represented in the sentences itself. You have more linguistic markers that relate to the target domain than to the source domain. You need more background knowledge for the source domain to realize that bombarded or piercing is something that's pierced someone somehow, the heart, the skin, whatever, is related to uh, weaponry and to, um, uh, yeah, I already said it. So what do you think the domain is here? <laughs> hmm, it's a bit more general usually because the metaphor is you. Hmm? are more still more general it's about the human interaction that you can do with these i mean that's already very that's see that's the problem you see it's not so easy to do that <laughs> and to agree on it so the in in the metaphor world people usually use the general concept of war uh, to to relate to fighting and to weaponry and all of these kind of constructs you can also have a more fine granular distinction, but then it's uh, less easy to compare about across corpora and languages. So here the idea is really it's uh, weapons or war. So words are weapons or words are war. Both of these exist. I want to try how easy this really is for humans if you're up for it. So if you have a phone, just scan this QR code uh, and wait for a moment. I still need to start the thing in the, tab in the background. And at home, please feel free to also scan the screen or just type menti.com and enter that code that you see there. Okay, does it work? Let me just start the whole thing in the background so that you don't have to wait for too long. Why does it not present? Ah, no. It's just very slow. You should also have the QR code, QR code here again. Can you see what I am? No, you cannot, right? Okay. No. 
Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you're ready, any problems, let us know in the chat or just open your mic and tell us if there's any problem. So the idea is to try exactly this. You get a statement, you get a domain, which is the target domain, and I would ask you to type whatever you think is the perfect source domain. You already have access to it? Uh -huh. It should be the same. Let me just go back. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Wait for a second. Sorry, I need to, to go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, so when we are ready, then uh, I will just start the uh, task, let's say. It's not a quiz. <laughs> okay, let me just go to the next slide. Here you go. Does it not show that? Yes, yeah, it should show the source oh, domain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All good. Okay, we got one response. Or maybe more. Maybe everyone's saying the same. <laughs> should probably stop sharing so that you don't see the responses until we have it. Okay. So feel free to still join in. Just connect via the links or the QR code here. The task is to predict the source domain given a sentence and a target domain. Okay. Right, let's take a look. So the, uh, we have some responses in, some more, okay. So the predominant one that most people said is still fire. Um, if we go, Next slide, I hope I should see. No, sorry. Oh, okay, you already went to the next one as well. So here, um, the source domain is supposed to be the physical one and the target domain is supposed to be uh, emotion, right? So here, the uh, original annotation or the gold standard annotation from the data set we used was really emotion is fire. So it agrees with what you said. But there are several different interpretations. I think this whole task of annotation of metaphors is really a bit messy because people don't always agree on what the source domain is. There are several interpretations on this. That's what I was trying to show. Uh, when we go to the next example, it's uh, you turn me on. That's a very typical one also for conceptual metaphors. The example, not so much, but the metaphor as such is very typical, very common. Okay. Radio. Ah, <laughs> oh, that's an interesting one. Sorry. Okay. So electricity is the big one. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I think we'll leave it at that. It was just a short experiment. Uh, so the original one, the gold standard, but that's not like the only truth, right? But the gold standard for this one was actually machine. So people always <laughs> talk about relationship is a machine, you know, our marriage is working, it's functioning. So here people thought, yeah, this is more of a machine, you know. 
Um, that shows one of the problems with this whole uh, data sets. Uh, many of them were procured with introspection. So people sat down and thought up examples. So they're not real examples with a specific intention in mind, right? But then if you give it for, um, if you just, you know, present it to someone and say, tell me which source domain that is, you get different answers. So there's not always one. And I think especially electricity, the big one in the middle that most people said, it makes a lot of sense here, right? I mean, what do you turn on? Switches, everything that has electricity. So maybe machine is sent the only, you know, source domain here. Okay, let's go back to the slides. That was just a short deviation. It's really nice that I can always check what, what people are seeing if they in the next. Okay, um, so when you try to have a model do the same thing and say, here's the sentence, here's the target domain, tell me which uh, source domain it is, uh, it's exactly as challenging. So what does the model say? And how do you compare uh, that prediction with the whole range of possibilities? So maybe it's a synonym of what the gold standard says. Maybe it's closely related. Maybe it's a domain that in a knowledge graph would be just below it, you know, just one relation and uh, far uh, away from it. So maybe those uh, source domains also make sense, you know. Uh, so that's what we were interested in. And we think that this kind of task shows you a little bit of how much inherent knowledge uh, these models have learned about metaphors. So the task is really something like you, your words pierce my heart and then you give the target domain words and then you expect the model to say something about weapons or war. Um, why use a generative language model for this where you have to pay or it's not so easy to access, slowly becoming better, but still not exactly open source or very easily uh, available. We thought that it's more interesting to go into the task without any explicit grammatical assumptions. So frequently in conceptual metaphor research, people had specific assumptions about metaphors, something that specific verb preposition pairs are indicative of spatial language and thereby give you a lot of information about uh, metaphors already. Those kind of assumptions limits the type of text that you can analyze and limits the type of domains you can look at and the materials that you can analyze. Furthermore, generative models are able to output any length. Okay, so you can just tell it, I want a sequence length of that, and then it can produce shorter and longer sequences. With the masked language models, you usually have one word. So really the one mask that you give it, and it's more difficult to make it predict uh, multi-word uh, expressions. And the most important thing is we thought it might be promising to try this, to see how it performs without any labels, without any idea or any, you know, trigger or input other than what I showed you about the source domain. So we don't tell it anything about the source domain. The data set that we used is a metaphor list that's online that was produced by Lakoff many years ago. It's very messy, very, very messy. So we uh, took a subset of that. Um, we tried to find the cleanest and uh, most reasonable uh, examples. And we used the LCC data set that exists in English and in Spanish um, for this, because we also wanted to try domain specific corpora. So the LCC is domain specific. It's more political governmental speech and it's bilingual. So that's interesting. Um, Non-metaphoric is extremely important because it's very easy for those kind of models to say it's this or that, uh, but it should also be able to say it's neither. It's none of these. It's actually not metaphoric at all. So it's always important to keep that in mind as well with those tasks. So what we did was go to the VU Amsterdam metaphor corpus and select sentences where none of the words in the manually annotated corpus uh, were labeled as metaphoric. So we tried to find sequences that are non-metaphoric. When you look through them uh, afterwards uh, manually, then you see some of them could actually be metaphoric. That's always the problem with annotation. You know, people get tired, make, make mistakes, and none of these data sets, of course, are perfect. Um, but at least it, it worked not so badly. It, it could have been worse, let's say. <laughs> um, so this is the distribution across uh, sets that we have. So you see, it's not a very huge data set. None of these are extremely huge. It's a couple of hundred sentences for each of these. Um, and the domains are still quite varied. So you still have a lot of different domains on these sentences, which is the most important part for us. So when we cleaned the data sets and selected subsets, we really paid attention to having as many different domains as possible in there. 
Um, we tried two things. The one thing was few shots. So you show the model a couple of examples, including the source domain, and then see uh, what it does. So see how well that works. If it just sees a few things of what it's supposed to do. Uh, we tried with two examples, four, six, eight, 12. That was it. <laughs> we didn't go further than that. And we also tried fine tuning. So how does it differ if you really train a pre-trained model on the task from just showing it a few examples? We had two different settings, uh, the whole training set that we had with 132 sentences, and then a smaller subset to see if it makes a difference. You know, if we just show it a few, does it somehow change the results? The prompt that we had was something like this. So extract the conceptual metaphor from the following sentence. The sentence is, you're wasting my time. I hope you're not thinking that right now. <laughs> um, target domain is time. Uh, source domain is to be completed. So that's really zero shot. So no, no other examples, nothing. So we turned that into a few shots. So for instance, with one example, it would look like this. Uh, we give it still the prompt uh, with the instruction and then some few shot, uh, in our case, some few shot examples because the minimum was two. That would look like this. So our relationship is at crossroads and then you have relationship as target and uh, the source domain, the physical one is journey again. So what we expect or were hoping or interested in is to see whether the model is extremely biased by the examples that it sees or not or what exactly happens. The evaluation we did uh, with two different scores, it was actually a very difficult thing to uh, consider. And it, I still think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done uh, in this direction, which is how can you evaluate a prediction that might be close to another word or might be close to another concept, but not exactly the same string. So how can you really measure how close the prediction is? Or even worse, which we also found quite a bit, if the model makes a prediction that's better than the gold standard. <laughs> so it's kind of tricky to evaluate this task, to be honest. We tried two things. The one is classical semantic similarity. How close is the vector of the gold standard to the vector of um, the prediction? And we thought it would be interesting to include some information that has hierarchical information in it. So if there is a concept that is close to the predict to the gold uh, standard, in a hierarchical tree of concepts, then uh, a knowledge graph would know, you know, that this is still sim more similar than something that's very far in the tree. So we use those structured resources or knowledge graph embeddings that are trained on structured resources that encode those kind of trees, which are WordNet, Dictionary, DBpedia, and Web is a lot, LOD, so that's linked open data. And to this end, there's a very nice, convenient library called Knowledge Graphs vec 2 go that we used for this purpose that gives you similarity values for all four of these resources. And then you can see uh, if all four of them are quite high, you know, then you can assume that it's quite close. So then we would count this as a good prediction. We thought it would be extremely important to also take a look at the test set results manually to see once the model has been, you know, trained or prompted, uh, what happens with the test set um, and really manually also take a look at uh, what kind of errors the model makes. So what we came up with is this error typology of uh, what the source domain prediction is, also looking at the triggers that are potentially there in the sentence. So if there's some certain words that really, really are very strongly related to that prediction, you can assume the model was biased by that. So it wasn't really looking at the metaphor, it was just looking at two or three words in a sentence and then said animals most of the time. <laughs> that happened really a lot. The results are quite nice actually for English. So for this metaphor list data set, we got up to 81% uh, accuracy. That's really plain string matched accuracy with, with not string matched, but similarity matched with the two meshes accuracy. Um, but then again, this data set is the one that's the cleanest, right? That's the one with most of those thought up uh, examples that were developed by introspection rather than real world data corpora. Uh, for the non-metaphoric, it struggled a lot more. So it was much more difficult to correctly predict if a sentence is non-metaphoric. The domain specific, more complex, longer data set was also more difficult and Spanish was the worst by far. And we'll come back to that. Um, when we evaluated which one worked best, 
like should we do few shot or fine tuning if you really wanted to use this model for uh, annotating data if you really wanted to use it to provide at least a suggestion to humans of what the source domain could be and then make it easier to annotate maybe uh, it was very fascinating to see that the few shot performance was a lot better than the fine tuning performance uh, so that is extremely parad paradox because we would have thought it would be the other way around. It would be, you know, if you fine tune the model, it would perform a lot better. Apparently, it seems to mislearn some things that it had there before. So it's very hard to explain what's going on there. That's the next step. <laughs> For now, we know that this is the situation. The best performance we got with showing the model most examples without changing the inner weights of the model at all, which would be fine tuning, right? So with Fusion, you don't change any of the weights. You really keep it as it was trained and just show it a number of examples as uh, assistance, let's say. Um, so what we got for fine tuning was low scores and most interestingly, low express expressiveness. So um, the best few shot got uh, up to 78 unique source domains. So it really tried to vary what was predicted. However, when we fine tuned, and that was one of the reasons why it probably performed uh, worse, it started to uh, predict less varied source domains. So it would always say machine, it would always say uh, plant, so it would always say journey. So there was this impact that we could really uh, notice, you know, that the source domains were less varied. Um, for the automatic evaluation, I showed you this course. And for the uh, manual evaluation, we had two annotators look through all the predictions compared to the um, actual gold standard, of course, with target domain and sentence context, and then really classify uh, the examples. Now, this inter-annotator agreement is not on whether the error class is the same. It's really just, do people agree that this is wrong or that this is correct? So there was enough agreement. It's actually more than moderate agreement. It's good agreement uh, on this, that the model predicted something that can be considered correct or not. Um, the error typology that we found by looking at the examples uh, is this one. It's quite big, but it's very easy to understand. So the first category is there is a trigger there's something in this sentence that um, misleads this prediction so whenever there was anything related to animals and even remotely related to animals such as a trough of property you know it would immediately predict animals if it said bare-minded or anything like even if it wasn't related to animals but just was the same string that was related to animals it would always say and frequently say animals so that was a very clear thing we saw so animal is a big thing in the model <laughs> it has a lot of knowledge about it there's some things that we couldn't explain uh, what was going on so we called it wrong without trigger so it's just simply the completely wrong domain and we're not exactly sure why so yeah you give i don't know how gif the idea relates to children. We couldn't really explain that one. Maybe you have an idea. <laughs> That's one of the examples where we weren't sure where that comes from. Like, why would it say, Sally gave the idea to Sam is ideas are children. So that was quite interesting. Too literal, where it really just takes what's in the, in the, um, in a sentence and basically starts classifying the words. So if you say money is investment, a da, you know? <laughs> so that's not the task, okay? That's absolutely too literal. When it says it's metaphoric, but it shouldn't be metaphoric because they saw him advancing is not so much metaphoric, at least according to the VU, VU Amsterdam um, corpus. And then it says moving is coming, you know, also not very good prediction anyhow. <laughs> Um, too specific, uh, it really looks at people instead of saying something more general, you know, so he finally caught up to schedule where it says schedule is people, uh, but the process is much more of prosecution or, some, or following or something like that. can also be too general, where it really just predicts something as general as space, instead of looking at the concrete spatial uh, relationship that's in the sentence. And the last one is that it selects something that might be related to the actual uh, gold standard, but is uh, further down in the hierarchy, some kind of sub-element. So I think surface is not bad. It's not a bad prediction, but the original one is copper. So it's a little bit of a different, you know, concept here. It's related, but it's not the exact same element. So the most frequent one, as you can imagine, is the one where something was misleading in the sentence. So wrong with trigger. 
followed by something is predicted as metaphoric, but should be uh, non-metaphoric. Oh, sorry, should be metaphoric, but it says non-metaphoric, sorry, the other way around. Um, and the last, the, the um, third category that was most frequent is wrong with trigger. So those are the three. So wrong with trigger, wrong without trigger, and it should be metaphoric, but the model says non-metaphoric. Those were the most frequent ones. However, we also found a couple of cases where the prediction was better than the gold standard, especially for the LCC data set that is much more natural than the constructed um, metaphor list data set. How am I supposed to learn anything if the school keeps placing roadblocks in my way? So the target is set as harm, the gold standard says path, and the model says obstacle. None of the similarity measures came close enough for our cutoff that that was counted as correct, but I think it's actually better than path, to be honest. <laughs> so I think the prediction is actually better. <laughs> So you see that it's not quite an easy task, really, especially to evaluate, very hard. We are actually drawing to a close for the first chapter of Obamacare. Uh, the target here is bureaucracy. The gold is said to be a story, but here also I think the book is better because it's about chapters and not about a story. So it's very specific to a book. So some of the predictions were counted as wrong, but were better than the human gold standard annotation. Yeah. So how well did GPT-3, in our case, Da Vinci 002, uh, grasp metaphors? Well, uh, fine tuning uh, are less expressive than few shots. So few shot is better here. You get some good results. If you look at the accuracy on a clean data set, it's actually quite high. So it can probably be used on some data sets to at least propose source domains to, um, to annotators but it's not so good with more natural sentences. So the more natural, which means longer sentences. We don't speak in four words, full stop. <laughs> we use longer, more complicated sentences. So the LCC is more natural uh, and therefore more difficult as we see from the results. Um, what we also saw is that there are specific types of errors that are more frequent, including also the famous hallucination uh, that's been analyzed everywhere for which we don't know where it comes from, where it just, there isn't any most um, reasonable evidence in a sentence why that would be predicted. So that would also be very interesting and something that we want to do, uh, investigate further what's going on there. Like why does it predict those kind of things? Does it speak Spanish? Um, not if we look at our evaluation, no. <laughs> However, the LCC Spanish data set is really extremely problematic. So you don't only have, ex you have extremely long passages, sometimes, you know, whole paragraphs that are one sentence. So even as a human, it's sometimes impossible to find what they were intending as a metaphor in it, because only the whole sentence is annotated as metaphor. So you don't know, or the whole, you know, paragraph <laughs> is annotated as metaphor. And then there's some weird ones where any kind of mentioning of agricultural product is annotated as, as metaphor, you know. So it's really, I think, low quality, to be honest. Um, this is the reason why there are some radically different uh, predictions from the gold standards. And it's a bit tricky with these very long sentences and very um, domain specific ones to find out what the prediction relates to also. So maybe the next step is also to do some kind of uh, token level uh, annotation or prediction, you know, where the model also tells you which parts of the longer sequences are actually metaphoric. Okay, so frequently, um, yeah, there's some, as I was saying, there are some passages where you really just don't know what the label relates to. However, this cross-lingual analysis is super interesting. So especially in the image schema world and also in the conceptual metaphor world, there's a lot of literature on how people conceptualize the world for real differently and then that affects language. So in Korean, you have no possibility to say, just put it inside, it's just not possible. You have to say, put it inside and it will tightly fit. So if I put water into this glass, it will fill up the whole container. Or if it's a piece of paper and there will be holes, it will not fill up the container. You cannot say, just put it inside. You know, it's impossible. You need to choose between these two because there's just no words for saying, put it inside without further specification. In other languages, you can just say, put it inside. In German, you can just say, you know, or um, 
So that's very interesting to see why it was important in Korean to make this distinction that there's not even the more general version anymore. Then, of course, this influences ex extremely how people talk about containers and how containers are then used in language. So that's a very, very interesting field. We have some students at our center who work on this uh, with manual annotations for now. Um, and one of the recently defended masterpieces was to compare um, metaphors in the cybersecurity domain in English, German, and Russian. And you could see that there are some differences on which metaphors are being used. So maybe this fishing metaphor exists in German and, and English as well, most likely. You sometimes talk about fishing in abstract terms, you know, but not in the cybersecurity domain. So this is something that's unique for Russian, you know. You couldn't find any evidence in the other two corpora that uh, cybersecurity is spoken about in terms of, you know, phishing for people or phishing for data, but it's quite common in Russian. So that's very interesting also to see, you know, what are the differences? Okay, so what are the open issues and the next steps? Um, well, more data sets really needed, <laughs> more analysis that are also cross-lingual and more interesting approaches also to evaluation. So these are really the steps that are very interesting and obvious um really have real world examples so no more introspection based i come up with an example while i sit in my armchair in the evening with my tea uh, kind of data set um and more systematic analysis you know really analyzing large data as they occur in the wild and really see how metaphors are used the evaluation is the trickiest part how can we come up with a better evaluation so how can we come up with something that allows you to judge better whether the source domain makes sense and first of all, and always, uh, multilingual data sets. So how can we improve the annotation process also uh, to have reliable and bigger multilingual annotated, uh, and, uh, annotated data sets? If you use an LLM, S, not T, <laughs> so LLMs, basically, models, uh, to do that, then you have the same effect as with any other kind of predefined things, you know, it's always the danger of blocking people's creativity. So if you see a solution already, will you just agree because you see it and it kind of biases you? So that's one of the problems if using this model for annotation. So how to best design the annotation process is quite tricky. So what's the take home message? Uh, well, analyzing metaphors makes a lot of sense. It allows us to interconnect the physical world with the abstract cognitive world. So that's interesting to analyze. Language models are good at predicting such physical metaphor grounding source domains on very prototypical sentences in English, but not so much in domain specific and non-English contexts. So this is really the way to go for us. So thank you very much, and I'm extremely happy to take any questions, remarks, complaints. <laughs>